afternoon. Can I ask everyone to find a seat? Good afternoon. I am calling to order this public hearing for the Los Angeles County Commission on Human Relations. It's a public hearing on uh, policing and human relations in the third supervisor of the district. And I want to welcome you all. My name is Isabel Dunning. I'm a professor of law at Southwestern Law School, and it is my honor and privilege uh, to preside over today's meeting. And I appreciate all of you all for being here, for taking the time to be here. And I want to um, introduce uh, the other commissioners who are here with me, and I'll let them do a brief introduction at this time. My name is Molina Abdullah. I'm the chair of the Human Relations and Policing Ad Hoc Committee that's convened these hearings, um, and I represent the second supervisor of the district in South Los Angeles. I'll get a chance to hear a few more words from Commissioner. Good afternoon, my name is Preeti Mulgarney. Uh, I represent uh, the 3rd District and um, professionally I'm the Chief o uh, Financial Officer of the Women's Foundation of California. I look forward to uh, hearing uh, from all of you today. Thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Valadipa Montaño. I also represent the 3rd District. I live here in the San Fernando Valley. And I really thank you all for being here and being willing to share your stories with us. At this time, if we could ask um, the senior minister of the, this beautiful church that's hosting us, I'm so grateful uh, for uh, their willingness to have us, Dr. Dwayne Winrow, who was going to say a few words of welcome. Thank you. Um, many of the other um, districts is the last one. 
um, although we will have two more uh, that will involve women um, and LGBT, as well as one that is exclusively for law enforcement. We came here today um, for all of you um, to hear from you about your personal experiences with law enforcement officers and agencies, and we want to hear what your suggestions may be for increasing fairness and equity in policing, and we want to hear your ideas uh, for building uh, and for maintaining positive relations uh, between po the police and the community. And before I actually talk about the structure, let me, um, as I promised you, have you hear from Commissioner Melina Abdullah. She is, as she told you, the chair of the committee that was the driving force behind this. Everyone, and thank you to the pastor for opening up the church. Um, thank you all for being here. I know that the third district is sprawling and um, many of you had to travel from quite a long ways um, from the Venice area, so thank you for coming um, and we realize it's an investment, so thank you for doing that. Um, I did want to just give some background on why we're doing these hearings. So this is the fifth hearing, the fifth district hearing. We will have, as Commissioner Gunning mentioned, we will have a sixth hearing for um, women and um, queer and trans folks um, to document their particular experiences with police, um, as well as it's not an exclusive hearing, but it's a hearing for law enforcement. We have asked that law enforcement not be present for the community hearings. And the reason that we made that ask is because we recognize that um, there was some mention of maintaining trust with law enforcement. We need to recognize that what we heard so far from these hearings, as well as what many studies say, is that there is not trust between communities and law enforcement, and there are reasons for that. So we wanted to open up space so that you could feel free to um, offer your actual experiences with law enforcement so that you won't feel inhibited at all by having law enforcement present as you tell your stories. Um, I do want to say that we don't have the ability to um, prohibit law enforcement from being here, but we've asked them not to come, um, and we've also not reached out to them to encourage them to come. And so that's the way the hearings are structured. Um, so the goal here is for you to be imaginative, for you to both be truthful in the telling of your experiences and experiences of people around you, um, as well as be imaginative in what you think solutions should be. What will happen from here is we will generate a report and in that report will be a list of best practices and suggestions that come from you as community members. Our hope in partnering with organizations um, is to allow this report to be something that you can advocate from. Let it be an official report that comes from um, a county body, the Human Relations Commission, that you can use to advocate from. Um, and so we don't see ourselves as being as having all of the solutions. And let me be very clear, this commission has very little authority. We cannot make law enforcement abide by the recommendations that you come up with, but we can publish those recommendations and allow that to be a tool for you. So we want to be very clear on that, especially during these times, and one of the reasons, again, that we did not invite law enforcement into the room, another reason that we did not invite law enforcement into the room is to remember what's happening in terms of ICE raids, what's happening in terms of officer-involved shootings, where we know, at least for LAPD, um, the, off, the rate of officer-involved shootings this year is three, um, up 30 percent over what it was last year. We also want to remember what's happened in the third district. Um, namely, we want to lift the name Brendan Glenn and remember what happened with the killing of Brendan Glenn in Venice. And so we want to make it as open as possible so that you can um, really be honest about what your experiences are. So again, we thank you for coming um, and we look forward to your testimony um, and we look forward to your recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner Dillon. So, the structure is that what we'd like to have everyone do is if you want to speak, and you have two choices in terms of where you get to stand in speaking, you can stand, I believe, down here, do we have a 
Yeah, one is up here, but if you, if you, if you, if, oh, it's over on the left, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so you have a choice. You can either, if you want to climb up steps, you can talk to us from there, but if you are challenged by steps or want to be down there, you can speak from there. We do need you to speak, fill out, excuse me, speaker forms, which you can get out in the hallway there uh, before you come into the sanctuary. To my right would be to your left. Um, I should say, since I'm pointing in that direction, that the bathrooms are also there, so you probably saw those uh, when you came in here. Um, you can testify anonymously, which is to say you've got a couple of choices. Um, you can use only your first name, you can use a pseudonym, a fake name if you wish, um, and you can also always email us and you can speak to um, staff who is um, outside um, about emailing us anonymously. You can also, if you don't want to speak here, there is the quiet room right over there um, in the corner. If you turn back there, you'll see Anne being raised. Um, and there you can be videotaped in the quiet room because you don't want to be speaking here, or if, because I'm only going to give you two minutes so that we can allow for everybody to speak, um, if you want to speak more than two minutes and we don't have an opportunity to come back to you towards the end, because we're going to allow that as well, you can in fact do additional testimony um, in the quiet room today. Um, let me see if I'll... Oh, yeah. So, it sounds like there was some kind of a shooting outside of the church or near the church. Um, so, if you see police coming by, it's not for this at all. Apparently, it might be because they'll be having to handle uh, something that is outside. So, if I get any more information about what that is, I'll let you know. But for right now, we're okay here. Um, as I mentioned, you're going to have two minutes you'll be able to see how much time you've got there. All of this is, what is in fact, being recorded and would have simultaneous interpretation, Spanish and English, and I want to stop for everything that I just said and actually ask someone who I should have introduced. He's going to think I don't even like him. He's our executive director, and I, there's nothing that the commission can do without him, Robin Tolan. Thank you, Isabel Duncan, and our chair. I wanted to say that esta audiencia está siendo uh, grabado en inglés y español, y uh, si necesitan uh, auriculares para la, la, la traducción en español, uh, se puede ir ahí atrás y hay uh, gente que puede ayudarles. Y tal vez si quieren testificar en, uh, anónimamente o no, uh, tienen que rellenar un formulario y se puede hacer esto a uh, también a través de un testimonio uh, privado uh, con este señor atrás que puede llevarle a otra aplicación para poder uh, grabar su testimonio en español. Okay. Um, the last thing I should mention is that there is food. Um, you can't eat in the sanctuary, uh, but the kitchen is as you come out the door to the left. Um, so that there are some there are some sandwiches and some water and I think maybe some coffee um, there as well for you to get and eat in the kitchen area and then come back to the area. I just want to encourage all of you. Um, I know you have a lot of important things to say. There may be a lot of passion, but of course we want to respect each other um, as we talk about these very difficult issues um, and speak straight from the heart. And I want to start out now with actual testimony, um, but we're going to have here from our anchor organizations, um, which are Chucho Central, Central Cultural, the Venice Justice Committee, the Santa Monica Coalition for Police Reform, Stop LAPD, LAPD Spy Coalition, and of course the Church of Christ. Um, so I want to thank those groups right away. Um, and we'll hear from them for about three to five minutes, folks. And we do have a timer, it only goes up to three, but for those of you who are uh, from these organizations, just know we still do want you to stay in the five minutes. Um, so, do we have Luis Rodriguez here? 
Not yet? Peggy Lee Kennedy? Please, come on.
just so happens that this last Friday I was at the Venice Library and they did a huge violation of the ADA with an uh, unhoused person with a service dog. They surrounded him with the police that are waiting out in front of the library. The librarian lied and said that the dog barked at a child and I was the witness. I was the only witness willing to get up and say something at that library about this poor unhoused man that was surrounded by the police at a library. Everybody else was looking down because they're afraid of being kicked out of the library, the only day place they can be, and use the bathroom and the internet, and get out of the elements. You know, I don't blame them. And then after they made this man leave the premises, I mean, not just the inside, but the whole property, which is a park outside, then the security guard kept coming around me. This is expensive stuff, you know. When people are criminalized, it goes to the county. They go to jail, they end up in court. We have a clinic, and last month, we had to move our clinic location, because it's free, in the rain, at a new location. We had 21 people show up with tickets who are being criminalized. And we get volunteer lawyers to show up in court. The court they initially have to go to because the West LA one was closed, is in Beverly Hills. You know, so we appear in Beverly Hills on their behalf. And then we try to get them to trial in Santa Monica and we fight these tickets, every single one, because they're bogus. They're bogus tickets. And in, the clinic was initiated in 2014 as a response to the city councilman, Mike Bonin, going in front of the police commission and asking for more police in Venice because all these neighborhood watch people got up there and said they were afraid of the homeless in Venice. And so they got Metro and the horse cops out there consistently is issuing ticket after ticket after ticket, and they're mostly bogus. And it costs everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, and I brought everything on this flash drive. I'm going to even have it. That's great. And I know you can just email it and we'll upload it to. Uh, I'm going to give it to Ray and I can email it, but part of it's video, so I didn't know how that was. That's great. So I have a couple of questions just for the record. So you mentioned okay. LASA. Can you just say what that acronym is? Uh, the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, which is a partnership between the city of LA and the county. And you know, the county funds efforts, homeless efforts, not just LASA, but other efforts like these, whatever, Clean Streets or whatever it is, helps fund these homeless efforts, which are primarily cops cued. They really are. So there's so many police, it's outrageous. And it's a situation that's very hostile. And no wonder Brendan Glenn was shot. You know, because they just brought in the police to go after the homeless people. And that was it in 2014. He was murdered in 2015. But he wasn't the only one killed that year. There were three homeless people killed in Venice that year. So, I mean, it, the police are not social service, service agents. I don't care what training you give them. They're trained to shoot people and enforce the law. So just two more um, quick questions. Um, one, you mentioned the tickets, and I know other houseless service and other houseless organizing um, groups are also doing ticket clinics like LA Can, which was right. um, our Ours, it's the same. It's the same basic tent. Right. So can you just share what these tickets are for? And then the last question I have for you is what recommendations you have, because you were saying that the police shouldn't be the ones to be responding to houselessness. So what recommendations do you have for how to address houselessness in the county? Okay, the tickets are um, what I call quality of life tickets. And uh, the many cities uh, across the country have created these tickets to go after uh, people of color, uh, poor people, and unhoused people. It's nothing new, but it is an, at an all-time high in Venice because we're experiencing uh, what I would call extreme gentrification. So uh, it's sitting on a sidewalk. Uh, LAMC 4118D. 
okay? Like if you are a, a hipster and you sit on the sidewalk in Venice, you're definitely not going to get one of those tickets. So, but any unhoused person sitting on a sidewalk could easily get one of those tickets. That's just a sample of how it goes. Or smoking on the boardwalk. Anybody else can smoke on the boardwalk? But an unhoused person is definitely going to get Because the police are there to take it to homes. There's really a special situation going on uh, after unhoused people. Just like uh, a gang task force is going after children and youth. It's the same thing. So what was the other question? Oh, the solution. Well, definitely we have to stop criminalizing people as if it's some kind of a solution. We have to put it so expensive. We have to, if the county is funding something that is cops cubed, why? We have to question that you're giving your money for police efforts. That's not a solution. Okay, you've got these service providers out there uh, saying they're giving services, but they're mostly talking to the cops. And what service are you really providing if you don't have the housing for these people to go into? So, I mean, it's, it's a dilemma. So, housing first, maybe? Housing first, yeah. Might, might be a concept that uh, the city could actually adopt. Housing for the unhoused. Yeah, that, that might actually be the solution for homelessness is homes. And most people who live outside want a home. Yeah. So that's just a fact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Michelle Whitting and Sherry Walker. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Whitting. Sherry Walker. Uh, we're with the Coalition for Police Reform in Santa Monica. Many of you uh, probably have an image of Santa Monica as being a very progressive, uh, relatively wealthy city. Uh, yes to both of those. Do we have problems with policing? Yes, we do. Uh, if there's nothing else that you remember from our remarks today, I would like you to remember these two words. Policing needs to be democratized. It needs to be under the control of we, the citizens of these cities in the state of California. Policing is one of the few agencies that is not under the control of citizens. Unlike our boards of education, which have enormous citizen control, policing is rogue compared to that agency. We don't need to get into how it got that way, but the fact is that's the way it is, and it should not be. We need to democratize our police departments, bring them under the control of those of us whom they serve. We in Santa Monica formed a coalition for police reform in the aftermath of some high profile incidents. We did a survey during one of the days of dialogue at the uh, Church in Ocean Park, and 75% of those in attendance said that they felt that police treat people differently on the basis of race. 100% of the people said they would take action to counteract that belief. The Coalition for Police Reform was founded with the idea that we, the residents of Santa Monica, need to take control over our police department. We have a group of about a dozen of us who are here today, and you will hear from them about the various incidents that uh, people have experienced. The coalition was founded in the aftermath of those incidents, and we have some very specific suggestions for change. They are structural in nature, we feel that the police department needs structural change, not just uh, after the fact uh, repair of uh, uh, justice after incidents have occurred. Uh, the other thing I would like to say is that the coalition in the last 18 months has collected stories from residents of our city on a video and we have been showing that video to various organizations in our town and uh, spurring discussion among the people who watch the video. 
We specifically went to three of those individuals and we asked them if they would give permission for us to give their testimony anonymously in two out of three cases to the commission. So I would like at this time to present the DVD of their stories to the commissioners because they're not able to be here today. And I'd like to then see the time over to Sherry. We'll tell you about one of our initiatives. Well, I see zero on the time chart. Is that just give me a you got two more minutes. All right. I just wanted to speak a little bit about an organization that derived from CPR, the Coalition for Police Reform, and that's the African American uh, Community Academy on Policing. In the city of Santa Monica, the police department has a, a, an academy where they invite the community in, you're chosen after you fill out an application and they teach you about the police department all the way from their history to the weapons that they use to the incidents that have happened in Santa Monica. And we decided as the ACAP group to uh, reverse that and have the police come out to us and we teach them about the community. We start off with the Black American uh, city tour that they take and learn about the history of Black Santa Monica. So we'd like to present this video to your chair. On behalf of those who were uh, courageous enough to tell these stories. Thank you so much. I appreciate their courage and I appreciate you for bringing them forward. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Since we don't have the screen, what I brought was something that we use in our organizing out on the street. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Hamid Khan. I'm with a group called the uh, Stop LAPD Spine Coalition, which came into existence about six years ago to research, understand, identify, expose, organize, and raise awareness in our communities about the massive surveillance and infiltration and information gathering that is happening in our communities. What is going on is that particularly since 9-11, the technologies that are being used on the battlefront in Iraq and Afghanistan, the tactics that are being used which are known as counterterrorism or counterinsurgency are very much being incorporated and codified into local policing. You may have heard about body cameras, you may have heard about predictive policing, you may have heard about various other technologies, and all of these technologies come from the battlefronts of Afghanistan and Iraq. Predictive policing was built in Afghanistan to identify and predict when the next act of insurgency may happen. So now what is happening is that these programs are being incorporated into daily policing and the same communities that historically have been, have been brutalized, that their rights have been violated, continue to be the targets of police violence. Because it's based upon the concept that previous data can help us understand and predict future criminal activity. If the previous data is gathered because of racist policing, so it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. So what that does is, this is a circle that if you're walking on the street, if you're in a park, if you're on your phone, if you're driving your car, all of these technologies are constantly tracing, tracking, and monitoring. All of these technologies are using to build databases and data, which is then put into these massive databases in these warehouses where information is being collected. They're called fusion centers. Drones are becoming active. Drones, which in a, in a very benign way, the sheriff likes to say that, well, they are, un, are unmanned aerial vehicles. Well, no, they are weapon delivery platforms. They are used for massive surveillance of various communities around the country. One of the things that we've been asking, that I really appreciate this process that the commission has taken of holding these hearings, but I think besides the hearings, there has to be an urgent action that needs to be taken as well. We appreciate that the effort is being made to, to come up with a report, but besides the report, we have to stop the police from getting more tools that is going to cause harm to our communities. One of those tools is this increasing use of drones. We've been able to keep the Los Angeles Police Department's drones grounded for the last three years, but now the sheriff has announced the use of drones as well. We were hoping that the Los Angeles Human Relations Commission would take action 
and reject the use of drones because what is happening is that North Dakota has already passed a law that police drones can be equipped with non-lethal weapons. Tasers, rubber bullets, tear gas, and tasers are not non-lethal. Every year on an average, tasers kill about 46 people in the country. So we are really hoping that this body takes an urgent action because we believe that there was something, that there was a motion last meeting, and we're hoping that this body takes an action and passes a motion to reject the use of drones. The FAA has come out with reports. In one month, 700 close calls in airliners were drones. Washington Post did a detailed study, that, and, the, and you should look it up and Google it, it's called When Drones Fall Out of the Sky. They said that 400 U.S. military drones have literally fallen out of the sky. They've just fallen out of the sky. Right here in the city of Pasadena, a drone fell on a stroller and a 10-month-old baby was severely injured. So what we are doing is that it's not just about surveillance or weapon delivery, it's also about the trauma and safety of our communities as well, because many times we get caught up into policies and programs and we forget the human impact, we forget the trauma and the emotional trauma that causes our communities. So I really, really, really appeal to this body to take immediate action. Please take immediate action and stop the sheriffs from using the rules. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Questions? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. By the way, we also have a desired petition. 3,200 people have already signed. They said that we don't want the cops to get rules. Okay. Thank you again. I really appreciate you as always. Luis Rodriguez? Luis Rodriguez? Oh, there you go. She's the one somewhere. So, uh, I'm with the Atrucha's uh, Culture Center and Bookstore. We've been here 16 years. We've been very active in the community and all issues, even though we're a culture space, we're a space that also provides safe space for talking about issues, including policing, including what's happening with the ice rage, which, as you know, has gone on even more recently. And uh, we really uh, want to share the, the work that everybody's trying to do to protect our community. I really am grateful for the African American churches who decided to be sanctuaries for migrants and also that we as the Latino community play a role in helping uh, in the extra policing and extra uh, uh, um, harassing or whatever might happen in the African American community. Uh, the thing for me is that we have to work together and Thea Chuchas is a space in which we have both black and brown and we try to have a dialogue but also share that we really have um, a common interest and a common in, uh, needs. And to me, this is what's important, that we look at what we do as the commonality of all of us in this community. Um, I, I know there's a lot of division, and I know that a lot of people have concerns about all that, and I'm not saying there's not differences that need to be um, extended and brought out, but I do think that whatever we do in this community, especially around policing, that it be a united effort. Uh, do we need to have a relationship with police that is acrimonious? I don't think so. But I do think that that means if we work with police, that somebody has to be the leader. And I think the leadership has to be the community. You understand what I'm saying? That the leadership comes from the community. That, it's, that the police being part of the community are part of it. They're part of a bigger package driven by community. Not the police themselves driving all the decisions and all the things. There's things being decided with police that community has no say so in. That we're not part of. And I think that has to change. Not only do we have to have a say so, we have to be the driving force. Uh, then I think we can work much better with police. I, the issue is whether the, the police can uh, agree to that. I have been to many meetings where the police have showed up, and I'm not uh, talking about individuals, but in general, where they say they're pretty much running the meeting even if it's not their meeting. You know what I'm saying? Where they're pretty much dictating the terms. I think as a community we have to say these are our terms. One thing is um, what's hurting our community is the fact that we don't have a lot of resources. We need resources for gang prevention, gang intervention. There is a lot of gang problems. I understand there are some incidents here. We can change it. We know how to do it. We have the experts, but we have to be brought in. If we're not brought in and supported, then it becomes just an issue for the police, and I don't think it is. I think it's an issue for the whole community, and the police can be part of this package that the whole community creates. 
and sustains and makes sure that everybody's involved. So that's my contribution. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Doctor. Reiterate something. So I just want to reiterate um, that the goal of these hearings, I know that a lot of folks are interested in um, bettering relationships with police. Um, and if that's your position, we definitely want you to state that. We also want you to feel free enough to um, be creative in your recommendations, right? So it doesn't just have to be confined to creating um, strong relationships with police. And I'm saying that in response to Mr. Rodriguez, that if you think there's other things that need to be done, then that can go into the best practices, it can go into the community recommendations. It doesn't have to um, be confined to how can we be friends, right? But where do you think resources need to be allocated? Um, what kinds of things do you think we need to be investing in? Um, all of that is part of the testimony that we're soliciting here today. And Dr. Winroom, we're going to come back and do some real testimony. Please, come on down. Let me invite you to your own church. <laughs> Police interviewed by 
the police was the police interview that took place by a black police officer came up missing, and that interview uh, occurred immediately following the shooting. The timeline of the shooting was enhanced uh, in the police reports. The killing of the Edie uh, was proven to be have taken took place within 40 seconds of the police officer's arrival. The Hispanic officer used non-lethal force. The white officer at the same time used deadly force. In other words, one officer shot a tase while the other officer shot his weapon. Jury declared that the police department was 65% responsible for his death. And so that was a financial award to that one minute. Well, let me tell you what uh, our coalition uh, members want to propose. Uh, we've been attending these so-called dialogues with the police department, uh, which is nothing more than police manipulating community organizations to advocate police propaganda regarding policing. And what the Los Angeles Police Department is presently uh, doing and promoting in terms of policing is what is called community relational policing. It is my agenda to point out to the community that this is not community-based policing. There is a difference between community-based policing and community relational policing. When you have a occupying force, a, 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 a police policing that is basically viewed by the community as an occupying force, it doesn't matter how much relational stuff that you do, you know, you're still putting citizens as well as uh, security officers in danger. Uh, that is, the example is, is when you're occupying Afghanistan, it doesn't matter how much you try to relate to the citizens, you are considered outsiders. And each time you approach a native, you know, there is a danger involved. You got to make a decision whether this is friend or foe. You know, and many times, the, not the right decision is made. And so what we're suggesting is, number one, uh, what we call community-based policing, that the same officers patrol and work the same area on more or less a permanent basis from a decentralized place. And what we mean is we want more localized precincts, that is, community-based precincts. When, I, when you look at what is going on in Pacoma, and Lake Terrace area where you have communities that are basically 80, 85 to 96 black and brown communities and look at the police. I saw a, a policing incident in that area. I literally counted the police officers. There were 15 officers there. 12 of them was white. Now this is an 85% black and brown community. You know, and, and when you're dealing with community, community, when we talk about community, we're talking about uh, extensions of the self-identity, the selfhood of a people. A community represents people who have some sense of shared sense of dignity, shared experiences. That's why, for example, in Los Angeles, we, 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 well, I'm not getting to that, I'm not preaching. But, you know, what makes us Laker fans as opposed to Sacramento fans? You know, this type of thing. That's a shared identity. And this type of thing. And so we want more localized precincts, community-based precincts. We want community-based police commissions that approve and screen police applicants that are sent to police uh, our communities. We want to working. We want working in a proactive partnership. Uh, working in a proactive partnership with citizens to identify and solve problems in this model of policing. Police are recruited and hired from the community in which they police. Police officers are regarded as citizens in uniform. You know, you don't have when you talk about diversity training, you don't you don't have to talk about diversity training when police officers are policing their own communities. You know, white police officers preach uh, policing out in thousand oaks don't have to go through diversity training. You know, why is it necessary for any officer? You know, when their extensions of their other people, the extensions of the community, you know, need to have that type of training. They just need to be members of the community and know the community, know the families in the community because they're there long enough. Yes, my time is up. 
and sit. Well, I'm gonna get this out. Is my church remember? <laughs> Okay. Okay. So police officers are recruited from the community to hire from the community. They exercise their power to police their fellow citizens in the implicit consent of those fellow citizens. Community-based policing embodies this, this, this consent. Thank you very much. Pastor, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that we got the three recommendations that you've given. I have um, community-based policing rather than a community relations yes, policing. Yes. I have um, uh, a community-based police commission, which I think is the first time we've heard that recommendation. And that commission would um, also contribute to the screening of officer applicants. Yes. And then the third one that I have is community should be citizens in uniform. They have to live and be a part of the communities that they're policing. Yeah. We're not necessarily suggesting that a police officer live in the community, and of course there are some on our coalition who, who fights for that as well, but we're saying they should at least be recruited from the community. Be recruited from the community. They must be recruits from the community, and the commission, when they're sent back to the community, the commission will approve their applicants. Okay. Their applications. So is that, did you have more, were those the three recommendations? Uh, no, those, that's basically the core of it. Local, local precincts, that is, Pacoma would have its own precinct. Lakeview Terrace would have its own precinct. We would know the officers that are assigned to that precinct, and those officers would be approved by the police commission of that community. Right. You know, instead of them. So what has happened in the past, for example, they would always say, well, send us applicants. Right. You know, send us people that they'll find a way to disqualify them. So I think, I think that we have those. And then two quick responses. Can you restate the name of the person that you were giving the... Christian Edie. Christian Edie. Edie. And, and was he killed by LAPD? He was killed by LAPD. Thank you. Okay. And one, I'm sorry, what was the date of it? Um, Attorney Robert, could you give us that? May 16th, And you were May 16th. the attorney. He was the attorney that litigated that case. Yeah. Oh, Johnny Cochran, don't you? <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> he, did a good, he did a great job. He did a great job. He did a tremendous job. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And let me just remind everybody that we are asking you that if you want to speak, there are forms that are in the back foyer right as you come in um, so that we can actually time it, make sure that how many folks we've got, Everybody's got two minutes. We might cut it down if there are too many, but if there are enough of you, if you have more than two minutes, then you can come back around at the end. So I want to announce again, please fill out forms. You can also either testify more privately in the quiet room there or additionally um, on video as well. Si hay, hay gente aquí que necesita traducción en español. If anyone needs a translation in Spanish. Okay. Martha Cherish? And you are, so you want to give it to Bahar? Okay. So she'll, she'll get She'll get for me. She can see. Please, go ahead. Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, and it seems like a, most definitely a really uh, sensitive issue that's going on in this life and world. Um, and, you know, while I've had many personal experiences, I know there's been many uh, police incidents around the world that are so violently based, you know, and it seems like the, the true meditation of it all is to understand our uh, multicultural yet commonality of humanity, um, to use any force other than violence, even when in, in, in circumstances where uh, there needs to be resistance to certain behaviors. It's just so um, taken out of context, and it seems like materialism 
is really the root of it. I, I have a lot of pictures. One of these is a, a caricature with the, the handcuffs and the dollar sign. It's something that seems to be really relevant and a shame. Um, it's a psychological ill, it seems. I have pictures of a, an incident. <laughs> I, the, the police have helped me become unhoused um, through an illegal eviction. I had a, um, <clears throat> a rented, converted garage with a yard, and the landlady, with the help of the police, as they suggested, had every right to, uh, um, you know, uh, slaughter the garden in her own words, um, because she's the landlady, you know. And uh, then they suggested I take her to court because obviously looks like it, would, it is a violation, however, they didn't saw her. So that, that incident, um, even though she failed the first time, she tried to sue me and evict me, but I had to face three years of uh, further um, incidents of uh, harassment, and uh, very materially based, you know, as the gentrification went on. But I have another incident in the street where about, you know, six or seven police officers surrounded me for riding my bicycle off the sidewalk as I was taking it off. And their expression in these recordings that I took shots of says so much, I think, in itself. I'd like to pass it around to see. You know, ultimately, it's fair a lot of bullying for the sake of helping the rich richer. And I would suggest community um, centers and just ways where we can practice kindness and compassion and share our multiculturalism because it seems like so much of the policing that is so violently uh, 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 produced uh, is so based on ignorance and fear as a combination with money and this material illusion. And you know, I just wish that we could share our multiculturalism where money wasn't the absolute factor. You know, um, God said in my uh, eyes, what was open that we can't serve two masters. And if we're living in a capitalist society, ultimately it might be really just a police state and nothing, nothing less. So and that's a shame, and it really causes for all of our destructions. It's such a beautiful family we have with all the colors, you know. Um, multiculturalism is a celebration. It's a, uh, it's a way, it's a reason we should have more kindness to spread because we have so much to share in our unique ways, you know, and it's such a shame that there's all these ridiculous, you know, just uh, rumors and lies and bad media and miseducation that's corrupting our lives, you know, whether it's the earth or it's the food or it's the air or our relationships and the schooling. Uh, there's so much corruption going on based on this violence that's coming in so many ways and shapes and forms. And it's a shame. I just wish we would create a space to share more with each other and uh, have that spirit of kindness take away the spirit of fear and violence, God willing, you know? Much love to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I have these pictures if anybody would want to see them. Thank you. Yes, please. Commissioners at the end of the season. Thank you so much. Roberts? Yes? No? Because I know it does say. Oh. Is it Stephen? So, yeah, my name is Shafin Roberts. I'm um, currently the director for the City Attorney's Dispute Resolution Program in Los Angeles. And um, first, I want to kind of make all of us aware that we do have a program where we mediate disputes between LAPD and the community. So if they feel like, when I say they, the community feels like, hey, I got pulled over because I, I was, because I'm black or brown or green or whatever it is, they can register a complaint with internal affairs and our office will set, set this space up with a facilitator, with a mediator that's trained to facilitate that conversation between LAPD and the officer. And we have that conversation, we try to get to an understanding. Information that comes back from those mediations are then fed back to LAPD, and oftentimes we look at policy changes. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, so I want to kind of make three suggestions about what could be done with LAPD or law enforcement in general. I know you guys are countywide. One is, I believe, um, EQ testing, which is emotional intelligence testing, should be done with the officers. 
Um, because I think oftentimes what happens is they just deploy officers randomly throughout the community. And people that are insensitive, and, and oftentimes those are people that are maybe new to the force, they're going into places, places that are of, of high intensity and tension, and they don't know how to, how to handle it. Um, so I believe there should be some testing, some emotional intelligence testing and training. And the, those with higher levels of EQs should be deployed to the areas uh, that, are, uh, that have the, the greatest sensitivity. The second is, I think we should have, I think uh, Mr. Rodriguez was, uh, Rodriguez was speaking to it, but I think we should have community agreements with law enforcement as to how the, the community itself is policed. Because right now it's kind of like uh, community, well, the police police are, sorry, no, I've, I've overstepped my, say my welcome, but I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly. Right now police are um, policing and they're kind of just doing what they think is best. I think ultimately the, the community and the LAP and, and police have the same um, outcome. I mean, we all want to save community, essentially. And so I believe it's about finding an agreement as to how we want, or when I say we, the community, wants to get there. With one, so they tell law enforcement how that's going to go. And lastly, I would say to look at the metrics, the performance metrics for law enforcement, because look, if you are incentivized to get write more tickets, and that's how you measure performance, they're going to write more tickets. But if you say, hey, look, the incentive is to link, them, link people with services, then you'll have people being linked to services and acting as though they care. So metrics should be aligned to the culture that you're asking, uh, that you really espouse that you believe, which is to protect and to serve, and serve being the word that we should focus on. Okay, that's all I have to say. Just quickly, can you tell us what um, agency you're with? You said you do mediations. Yeah, the uh, city attorneys, uh, LA city attorney's office. Thank you. Thanks very much. Craig Assi, A-S-A-C-I. Did I, did I, no, that, is that you? Okay. <laughs> is it Craig anyway? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'll submit to you, uh, if you didn't see Vice the other night, there was a, uh, I guess you could say, a segment on the St. Louis Police Department and how it's divided in terms of black cops and white cops. And one of the officers said essentially within that, they communicated to him one of his supervisors communicated to him that <clears throat> there was a predisposition among black folks to be violent and criminal. And he more or less approached his policing based on that and his interactions with cops before he become a cop based on that. And that's pretty much the way, that pain is pretty much my pain. Because within that structure, I had a gun pulled on me at the age of seven by the store detective. Now, you know, I say that to say, you know, what the Reverend Monroe said essentially was what I was going to say. Because we didn't create this us versus them mentality as African Americans. Specifically, if they don't see me as a human being, if they don't grow up with me, they don't know anything about me. So therefore, they'll be rough with me. Consistent with that, when it comes back to recommendations, the only thing I would really add as a person who worked with kids, I can see sugar and some of that same behavior once they come out of the candy store. I see police officers with, you know, in terms of sugar effect. That was a running joke about policemen and donuts. So, my only other suggestion is when you have abuse cases, look at the person's diet. Thank you. Thank you. Audrey George. Audrey George. Yeah, then, and behind, after Audrey George will be Joanne Berlin and Derek Fortune. <clears throat> yes, sorry. Um, so I wanted to talk about LAPD, which is the most murderous police force in the whole country for um, many years. 
of the past five years, um, I think at least three of those years, it, otherwise it comes in number two. In cases like that of Brendan Glenn, who was killed in, in Venice, you have just one example of how black and brown men, women, and children are killed with impunity. The reason there is such a lack of accountability is because that the police commissioners who are supposed to oversee the LAPD are political appointees and supporters of the mayors that have appointed them. What we need is for the commissioners to step down so that we can have a bona fide civilian oversight body. Some of the changes that need to be made also include the venue. No civilian oversight committee commission should be conducted within LAPD headquarters where when we go to those meetings there are as many as 30 or more police in the room, armed police, surrounding and intimidating the people that are there to attend. They need to um, change the time so that they're having meetings when people can actually go instead of at 9.30 in the morning on Tuesdays. There need to be no cops in that room. Commissioners must also have disciplinary authority and subpoena power. Otherwise, they're just figureheads, which they are at the time. The only other thing I want to say is that they need to fire Officer Kevin Ferguson, who lives in Anaheim and shot him and discharged his gun while he was off duty in the presence and because of his anger at 13-year-old children who had crossed his lawn. Thank you. Joanne Berlin, I um, work with the Committee for Racial Justice in Santa Monica, which is part of the Coalition for Police Reform there. And um, we started thinking about what kind of racial profiling was going on in Santa Monica after the Trayvon Martin incident. So we started back then thinking about some of these issues. And um, found out that people in Santa Monica didn't believe there was, white people in Santa Monica didn't believe there was racial profiling in Santa Monica. So part of the reason we made this video as an educational tool. But um, well, our experience in Santa Monica is a small town, so to speak. So we can actually talk with the police chief and with the city manager. We can have meetings. And... Um, We've tried to talk with them about changes in some of the policy, because we, we asked for all the policy and we, we reviewed it. And, and um, mentioned to them that there is nothing in the policy about de-escalation. There is no policy that your first choice in trying to relate to someone um, is to, to keep in mind to de-escalate the situation. We sat through the whole trial, many of us, of Justin um, Palmer. I don't know if some of you have heard about him. He's the fellow, who, black fellow, who was trying to um, charge his electric car in one of the parks in Santa Monica and was um, told that he had to leave and because the park was going to close. And he made the mistake of trying to talk to them. He made the mistake of trying to ask, you know, what, what is the problem here? And, um, I, I still have some time and it's important for me to charge my car because I have to take my daughter's so, so what we've also discovered in trying to talk with police is that um, they don't when they give an order they don't want to hear anything from whoever they're dealing with they just want you to do immediately what they say to do when they say to do it and if you try to talk to them like a regular human being um, you can get into trouble fast Justin was uh, severely injured and was um, one of those police involved in that um, interaction with him was found liable for use of excessive force. So even in a so-called progressive community like Santa Monica, there is racial profiling, there is use of excessive force. And uh, I think the biggest barrier to doing something about it is that the police will just not admit that it's happening. They just will not acknowledge it. And so I, I affirm what everyone else has said about needing civilian oversight. We need to have some kind of way
to get uh, regular people from the community to um, have some say over who is hired and some say over some of these incidents because even though they, they were found, uh, this one policeman was found liable, the police department in Santa Monica thinks the only reason that that case was lost, so to speak, uh, was because the jury just didn't like him as a person. Was that the, the police department was Santa Monica? Yes. Do you know the name of the officer? Who, Fujita. 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 He's still on patrol, and he's still on patrol in that same neighborhood. Um, it's over a million dollar settlement. Um, he's still there. He's still there. Okay, thank you very much.
convict leasing system, whereby people were arrested for trivial things like loitering and ended up being slaves for a year or two. Um, well, on in the modern times, uh, mur murdering Black Panthers, uh, torturing and murdering people at Attica Prison, um, the Ferguson thing, it goes on and on and on. In light of all that, how can we possibly trust police to police themselves? It, it's ridiculous. And yet that's the situation. They have autonomy. And we need commissions that have, that, as Audrey said, hiring power, subpoena power, and, um, disciplinary power. But in general, I think we need to not so much improve the police as to get rid of them. Um, replace as many as we can. Uh, instead of having police come and deal with mentally ill people, have mental health professionals do that. Instead of having police uh, deal with the homeless, have social workers work with them. Uh, the more we can, if I were a black person, the main request I would have of police is stay as far away from me as possible. Thank you, Thank you very much. Wendy Winston? Then after her. When my, when my daughter was 14 years old, a couple days before Christmas, we went to Hollywood Boulevard to go shopping for Doc Martin boots. Her and her white, punk rock looking friend, boyfriend. We got out of the car. I didn't notice that the cops had already cruised around the corner from us, but um, he went up. It turned out he was older than I thought. He was 19. But, um, and he went up against the wall and kind of crouched down and lit a cigarette. And then um, we kept walking. Next thing I know, the police pull him off to the curb. They throw him against the wall, they put his arm back here, and his arm was in injured, and he screamed out in pain, and my daughter, you know, tiny little daughter, 14, just saw this injustice and freaked out uh, and started yelling at the police and cussing them out. They threw her down, all 90 pounds, and handcuffed her and threw her in the police car and told me to get his ID out of the car. So I'm walking back to the police car and I kind of heard something, but I wasn't sure what it was. I got his backpack and as I'm walking, I see like sparkly stuff on the street. And I get back there and my daughter had kicked out the back window. She had a panic attack and, and she was crying and screaming. And the police ended up, you know, taking her away. And I had to go to the police station, get her out. They gave her a resisting arrest and vandalism of police. Uh, it went on for two years. She ended up being in re residential placement for two years. And she went to community um, juvenile hall for six months and finally got out. I mean, it was like from 16, 15, 14 to 16 and a half in the system. Because we were shopping for Doc Martin boots on Hollywood Boulevard. And then um, there was another time. I'm a recovering drug addict. I got clean in 1988. But I had incidences. In Santa Monica, I, me and her, my, my oldest daughter's father were kind of known, so we would get pulled over, our arms checked, the car searched, just on like a periodic basis, like just driving down the street. Another time I was raped in West Hollywood. This is when I was about 19, and I was like, I was kind of like into Bowie, and into, I was married to a gay man. I was just into being like male and female, both together. And so, you know, you couldn't kind of tell what was going on with me as far as sexually, but I was raped, and I called the police, and I was crying, and they came up to me and left, because they couldn't tell if I was a boy or girl. And, uh, and then another time, um, what was the other time, uh, that, um, the, oh, I was at, um, I was married to a gay man, and we wanted to all go to this bathhouse, a gay men's bathhouse in Beverly Hills. And so they had like painted me up and put a dildo down my pants and you know, it was kind of fun and cute. They didn't let me into the bathhouse because I wasn't a man, didn't have a man's ID. So I was leaving the bathhouse to go back to my dad's house in Echo Park. 
These guys are cruising around me, cruising around. They offered me a ride. And I'm like, okay. And I get in the car. Then they got driving down Wilshire Boulevard, get to around Normandy. I mean, 20 minutes has gone by. They start like hitting on me, you know, trying to get me to have sex with them. I'm sitting in the middle of them. And um, they pull up into this vacant lot on Wilshire Boulevard around Normandy. And, and then they offer me money. So I, I, I do, I say I'll give them a blowjob for $100. They bust me for, for, um, for being a prostitute. And I actually got a lawyer that time, and they, they ended up giving me, dropping it down to re, um, resisting arrest, or disturbing the peace. But I was just wanted to go home. Thank you. Thank you so much. Donna Perkins? Hello, my name is Donna Perkins. I live in North Hollywood, and I'm also a member of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. I don't have any personal stories, but I want to support the need for investment in more mental health counselors and social workers, both in our schools and in the community in general. We need better job training and job development. These are the things that keep us safe. We need less police. And body cameras alone won't keep us safe. We remember Brother Africa, who was killed on camera. We want to see the effective use of the funds to be allocated under Proposition H and Triple H to help end houselessness. We remember Brendan Glenn today, along with all the other homeless and houseless people killed on Venice Beach. We also want to participate in citizen oversight to help in the corruption in our current law enforcement as evidenced by the conviction of Lee Baca. Thank you. Thank you very much. Theodore Gales. Theodore Gales. Good evening, everybody. My name is Theo Gale, and I'm a member of the NAACP, as well as a member of the CEDAW Football Church of Christ. I will speak briefly on experiences that I've had with the police, which are both negative and positive. I have been treated over the years, over many years, with abuse by the police department, and occasionally wanted to come around and do something that was positive. That would cast a different reflection in my mind upon what the police is all about. But of course, when Dr. Winkler was up here talking and speaking about community-based policing, I agree with that 100%. And it's most definitely what we need. We need people from the community, who were raised in the community, who was a part of that community, to be encouraged to become police officers, to be encouraged to go back and perhaps live in that community. But we can't do that because of the lack of fun and the unwillingness of our system to deal with a black community, with a diverse community in the proper manner. One of my chief concerns is for the training of police officers. I'd like to know just how much training they have in the area of mental training. It is my opinion that they should have, by all means, background check from individuals who decide that they want to become a police officer. I would like to know why you want to be a police officer. It doesn't seem like a very uh, interesting job to me, and it's a dangerous one, so why would you want to be a police officer? The background check would try to weed out those who come from the family, and their history is that of the Ku Klux Klan, KKK. We don't need members with such background as that on the police force, and I can't and then 
had some of these people who own the baby police force. We need background checks and found out that they had negative encounters with people of another race where they harbor this hatred within their mind, within their soul, and their ambition is to go out and reflect harm upon other people. In being a member of the NAACP, this organization that I'm a part of, Chapter 264 of San Fernando Valley, it is my concern also for some of the health issues that we have when we, I've heard it mentioned several times up here, mental health, and the people who deal with those problems. We most certainly need health professionals to deal with those problems. This young man that Dr. Wendell was speaking of that was up here, believe you me, he was a harmless young man. He was a peaceful young man. He was quiet, he was cared, and he was loving. But in a matter of minutes upon the arrival of the police to that address, he lay on the ground dead. That is sad. For me, any way you look at it, no way you can justify that whatsoever. I set out to the trial of that case, and I found that they came back and said that if they acted within police policy, that caused me to wonder what are police policy? Where do they come from and who are the people that make these policies? Then there was a civil suit after that which found the police officer was directly at fault and taking this young man's life. A mild a cash award was granted to the family. But believe me, a cash award cannot replace the life. The police officer, right this day, at the end of the day, they are going home to their families. They're playing with their children. They're, they're, they're in an fellowship of time with their wives. But this young man, this time we will never see him again. This young man, who might have stepped out simply because of ill trained, ill prepared police officers. Therefore, I wonder, I wonder about the training. I, I wish someone could tell me, you know, just what qualified the individual to become a police officer. What qualification do he need for you to give him a baton and our God and send him out into a black community, send him out into a diverse community? Is the six months of training that a police officer receive enough to give him a gun? Yeah. That's almost like taking a brain friend and sitting in a school for six weeks and giving him a scalpel. I don't want him to operate on me. Yeah. I don't need that. My life. My time? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yes. Well, thank you so much. They, these are excellent questions, and, and thank you for reminding us of that last awesome night again. Thank you so much. There. There's many more. 
Many more names and hashtags. When are people going to take you seriously and treat people as with if it's if it were your own family? If they put your daughter, your sister, your mother, your cousin. This is the mindset that we need as people to come together. We can't be complacent and just pretend like, oh, well, it's not my issue. This is where we start. If you're serious and you don't want it done to you, think about the next person. Chief Beck has to go. Who is behind Chief Beck? Follow the money. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and um, I'm 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 glad because this is an important thing that we raise our voices to what's happening. And I know that one of the things is what are the incidents that we may have to relate about uh, what what police are doing in our communities. And while I haven't been the direct um, directly affected in a case myself, I know that in our communities there it happens constantly. And so I don't want to speak to a particular incident, I do want to speak to the kind of situation that we live with as a result of that kind of an atmosphere. And I come here as a, a, a director of a nonprofit, which is a cultural center bookstore that I founded with my husband Luis. And the reason why we founded it was to give another option, another way to be in community, and another way to recover. Because in many ways what we're recovering from is the very um, poverty of access to resources, the poverty of an access to dignity, a poverty of imagination of what this world can be like if we have the ability to see each other, hear each other, and accept each other. That's what's wrong with, I think, what's, what's behind the way we are, what we have at right now. We have in place uh, a force that's alien to our communities. This is why I think what's being proposed that, that there be uh, policing, community-based policing, that is, I think, what has to come back. We have to have places like, for instance, the one we have, that, and they should be all over. In every community, there should be a space where you feel safe enough to tell the truth about what's going on in your homes, in your community, in your schools, so that we don't have the issue of having to deal with things by force, where we can actually heal, become more well, have the kind of responses for ourselves and others where we don't have to resort to violence and control, where we can control ourselves, where we know ourselves well enough to know that when we look at someone else, we're looking at ourselves, it's as if we're a mirror. And that's not what we have right now. We have an us and them mentality, where somehow we are the enemy, and we are to be controlled and put down. And that has to end. It contributes to, to the kind of mental illness that we're seeing everywhere. And again, I think the root of it is poverty which I have to say, one of the things that I'd like to announce also, and, and I'm sure all of you know of this, but there is a growing movement to really ground things where it's not based on uh, protecting the institutions and the things that maintain poverty, but rather this access, the question of access, again, to the kind of human abundance that we have and making it real in our communities. I think that there's a way to do it, again, uh, community centers, churches that are that are community based that really listen and really bring up people to their fullness. So I just want to say thank you for, for this opportunity to speak. And uh, and we are one of the anchor organizations. We we hope to to see the kind of uh, response to the the question of immigration and and policing one that's fair and that really again we start to see each other as brothers and sisters. We are fellow human beings and we need to respect each other in that way. Thank you so much. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Good Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. My name is Pierre Ivan Hanabiola, and I'm a lifetime resident of Pacoima, as well as the executive director of the Great One Aiders, a community organization that is devoted to using hip hop.
hip-hop culture, athletics, as well as the arts to empower youth and families throughout our neighborhoods. One of the main things that I came up here to speak about was about the lack of privilege that there is in our communities. Granted, that's a story that's been tried and tested and put out there. I myself, I'm the 1% in Pukwama. I'm an Ivy League educated individual. I was blessed enough to be able to get a full ride scholarship to go out to Brown University. But even at that, that doesn't stop me from getting that pass, essentially, that hood pass from the police. Because I'm still, in that sense, put in a position where if I'm out with my kids, my, my great one leader juniors, my youth leadership group, and I'm showing them our own community, showing them our history and our values, here comes the police siren. They stop us and they say, why are you guys congregated together? Now, I want us to think about what's been going on since the gang era, essentially, out here. And things such as gang injunctions that have been put within our communities that we tend to not speak of anymore. Granted, these are things that people think out of sight, out of mind. The cholos aren't walking the streets, gangbanging anymore. But these are things that still affect us. This is a history of things that has been impacting us. So we must review gang injunctions. We must review similar policies that have come from gang injunctions, especially in underprivileged communities, because that disallows young individuals like myself to rally other young individuals and really make a difference, because we're all considered gangsters at that moment, no matter our education and privilege. Another thing is more collaborative programming with police officers. We've been blessed enough to be able to collaborate with LAPD and Los Angeles School Police Department to do wrestling programs, to do cultural arts programs, and give the opportunity to the police officer to be humane, to demystify them, to show the people they are human and there is humanity in them. Um, just to kind of speed things up here, we must also think about the culture of violence within our community and this pipeline to criminality that we actually create and instill, especially within our own undocumented immigrant communities. If we have individuals like ICE or other federal agencies coming in here threatening to deport individuals in their own place and being, that actually creates more opportunity for criminals to be criminals. Individuals are scared enough to go to their police officer and now you're telling me that they're thinking in their mind, well, I'm going to be deported, so I might as well not tell them that I got raped so that I don't get deported. And in that sense, it becomes an issue because you're creating that direct pipeline. So let us think about community response committees. Let us think about community action committees with bargaining power that comes from the city and the county. Neighborhood councils are great, but they have a lot that they have going on with them. So we must also develop individuals, organizations that can come together as collectives and work hand in hand with the overseers, essentially. Hopefully we can actually change that title to something more true to officer. Because in that sense, we're just promulgating the same values that, that have been promulgated since America's history of slavery. With that all being said, let's definitely continue this work that we're doing here. Thank you so much for coming out and really trying to understand what our viewpoint is. This is something that's amazing and I hope it continues on. Let me just ask you a question. You mentioned community response committees. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Yes, exactly. I actually have a perfect example. Uh, there's a church, North Hills United Methodist Church, uh, Pastor Fred Morris, who started a refugee center out in North Hills, California. North Hills was, aka Sepulveda, Prostitution Central. There's a big immigrant community there, there's a big gang community there, there's a lot of underprivileged individuals that live there, lots of violence. In response to this, the United Methodist Church created the refugee center to be able to give a safe haven to immigrants within the community to come out, say what they have to say, get resources without feeling that they're going to be put in, in harm's way. Essentially, they've uh, been able to develop into a nonprofit collective, and the idea being that when there's ICE activity around the area, they'll call a hotline. The hotline then sends a text message out to all the community response members who then go to the location and stand up for the individual, whether it's recording to make sure that you don't implicate yourself in the criminal activity that is going on through ICE, or just essentially speaking out and telling them to get out. These types of things show the power in people, show the power in collective energy, and let us not allow them to take that away from us because our collective energy is what's going to allow us to overcome all this as well. Thank you. Thank you, you. Ask that question. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yul Gray? Hello. 
Nice to see all of you here today. Uh, I've been waiting for this opportunity to get a chance to say these things that's heavily on my mind to the committee that can do something about it. Um, I watch the news every day, all day long, and I've been doing it for a long time. My thing is, is this is about, or as the police is concerned, you know, everybody has a lot to say about the police bad, but the thing up here is we really need the police. Without the police, this world would be in chaos. So we need the police. But what we need is for the police, if they're going to dress up like army men, they should be able to conduct themselves like army men. Like a Marine can take a knife or a stick from a man or a woman. Police officers should be able to take a knife, a stick, a bat from a man or a woman. They should be able to, if they ain't going to take it from them, they should be able to shoot them where they, they don't have to kill them, but make them where they, uh, they can't be home. Police officers need a whole lot of training. You know, they act like Marines and soldiers. They dress like it. They need to conduct themselves like uh, So, you know, all this unnecessary killing needs to stop. It truly does. And uh, I remember from like in the early 70s, police officers used to shoot you in the leg, you know, just to uh, stop you from killing. And that's what police need to do. Police need to stop killing people unnecessarily. That's the simple thing up and all in. And it goes back to what the brother was saying. He was saying about how the police need to have a better background check. They do. They need, we need to know where these police officers are coming from and why they want this job. You know, and just as simple as that. We need to stop, the police need to stop killing a whole lot of people unnecessary. What do you look like? Here you are, a man shooting a woman who got a poke. That don't make sense whatsoever. You know, police, if they got to shoot, they want to shoot them in the leg and then, you know, take the pole away. And that's, you know, that's a simple thing. You know, and uh, for us lately, you know, people haven't been speaking about the police killing blacks lately because they haven't been doing it. But, you know, as we remember, you know, just recently, you know, blacks have stepped up and said, hey, man, if y'all go, you know, if we're going to die for a cause, if we're going to die for this cause, we're going to kill the police for killing blacks. We don't want that to happen. That's the seed that's already planted. We want to bring that to an end quickly. So, you know, police need to be instructed that, hey, if that, can, that type of behavior keeps going on, it ain't going to do nothing to get worse and worse. And so we need to stop that before it gets started because that will lead to a civil war. You know, blacks against police, then it's going to be blacks and whites, and then, you know, everything gets out of the way. So we really need to uh, do that. And that's all I really have to say. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. God bless you. Thank you. I've got Rosalind Scarborough, Tara after her, and C.O. after that. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, I wasn't going to talk because I'm coughing, but thank you for the water. My name is Rosalind Scarborough. I'm a member of this church, but I'm also the president of the San Fernando Valley NAACP. I'm not going to be long. Uh, there's a lot we could say negatively uh, regarding law enforcement. The Lord knows we have plenty of opportunities to do that as well. Uh, I just want to mention, we here... You don't have to worry about it, I won't use it. I won't be using two minutes. Um, we here in the San Fernando Valley have had many negative experiences with law enforcement, but we've come a long way. You don't see the level of brutality here in the valley that's prevalent in other parts of Los Angeles because we've had our time. Uh, we're the home of the chokehold, which happened to a member of this congregation, and the NAACP, under the leadership of Jose de Sosa, put Pacoima on the map. We also are the home of the battering ram that was 
most of this was with LAPD Foothill Division. We had the battering ram, the chokehold, and then the Rodney King beat. We also then had a young man who was killed here. Uh, so we've had many opportunities to have negative uh, impact with law enforcement, but we've come a long way here. And so uh, what I want to say is what we're doing, just it, it's going to take a multi-layered and collaboration with many different entities to solve the problems with law enforcement that are not only about law enforcement, about the education system, is about many institutions that are embedded, that are entrenched in long histories of racism. But just one small thing that we are doing with the NAACP to try to bring about some change, we uh, believe that the main problem with why law enforcement kills so many African American men is because they fear them. They say they're in fear of their lives, but the reality is they're just in fear of a black man. So because that is prevalent all across this nation, uh, we believe that that's because they don't know one another. They don't get to know one another. They don't uh, move in the same circles. They don't run into each other in the grocery stores. They don't run into each other in social situations. They live very separate lives, and many officers uh, tend to probably live in enclaves that are safe where they can have their kids out, you know, at nighttime. Uh, and then when they encounter black men who live in war zones in many cases where they're having to have this tough ex exterior just to survive, once they encounter one another, they're in fear, all of a sudden, next thing you know, a black man is shot. So what we're trying to do is to bridge that gap, uh, to break those barriers. And so we've implemented something called, um, I'm sorry about that, okay. We've implemented something called Breaking Barriers and Breaking Bread Basketball Bash. We're planning right now for our next one, we started it two years ago, where law enforcement and the community, preferably men, men who have had negative experiences with law enforcement, interacting with officers who've had negative experiences with black men, coming together and playing basketball together the teams are intertwined, not them against them. And then once that's over with, to sit down and share a meal together and then get to know one another. So we have that coming up. We're looking at sometime either June or July. The dates are being worked on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. <laughs> uh, my question is, you say that things have improved and uh, beyond this particular uh, example that you gave around breaking barriers, can you um, speak to why you think they've improved in this community? Uh, because they've been in the line light, they've been, we've had the Christopher Commission, in fact, I believe the Christopher, the Christopher Commission just ended uh, in January 2013, the same, and then a few months later the young man was killed. But uh, they've had a lot of opportunities to work on the um, rules and things with law enforcement. And we do work together with them. We're trying many things. I have a whole lot of ideas, but it's not something I can really just share in this setting this quickly. But uh, we are working with them, uh, trying to bridge the gap behind the scenes. But we just had a lot of years where, we've been, where they've been um, bomb blasting in the media. You know, and so they had to do something different. But the Christopher Commission was probably one of the biggest things that changed it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tell. Hi, everyone. Um, thank Hi. you uh, to the committee for hosting this and the church for letting us be here. Um, I'm really disturbed by a lot of things. Um, I do appreciate um, the man who spoke before me stating that she believes things have improved. Like, since what time frame? That's kind of my question. Like, from the 60s and 90s, you know, I was, I'm raised out here. And in 96, no, 98, I was stopped by the police just being tardy to class and was slammed on a Okay, it's not my time. <laughs> don't, 
Don't, don't apologize. Sorry. Take your time. I'm a grown woman now. But that day, I never, I never even thought I would experience something like that. I was just tardy to class with my friends. And we missed our bus and we had to walk and the police stopped us. And because I've seen it on TV, I'm like, oh, what's the meaning of this, officer? Because I've seen people say that on TV. The cop can tell the crime. These are women police officers, too. White women. S grabs me from my wrist from behind, slams me on the car, cuffs me, searches all of my belongings, and I'm in the eighth grade. For children to have to experience that, and never feel safe from being a child to an adult feeling safe from the police, that's a problem. To me, that, that doesn't see improvement. They don't have to just kill people in the street for there to know that there's an issue with trust with the police in the community. Yeah. Okay, that was, that was kind of my preface to what I'm going into, but recently there was a shooting on at Slauson, at the 24-hour fitness, a man was killed on March 8th. His family was not notified till the 13th. He had three kids. His family can't find him. He had some type of mental breakdown episode, and the police are there trying to help him. And let's see, and I guess out of frustration, they were with this man about two hours. They still decide to kill him. That is unacceptable. We have to have resources for people in our community. There needs to be a certain, especially when people are having mental breakdowns, there needs to be a certain, not task force, but mental health professionals to help these people who are having breakdowns. These police officers aren't trained in mental health. And to where they just get frustrated and take someone's father, take someone's boyfriend or husband or partner. And now these children have to grow up without a father. Unacceptable, and I, and I know within the time when we're trying to figure out other ways to either engage with the police department, abolish the police department, what have you, there needs to be a time frame. Once they kill someone, the clock starts ticking. They need to be required to have a, a, a full report and, and turn around and give information to the family. We're allowing too much time for them to cooperate stories. It's annoying, it's, it's frustrating. Damn, damn them, I'm sorry, I'm in a church, I'm sorry. Um, forget about those, um, what else, those cameras. That's like, they need to have everything, they need to separate these people, get their statements, and make sure that their stories make sense. When they spend it a month's time to hang out and get their story together, that's, that's a disservice to the community, that's a disservice to this family, and they're not getting real answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Tara, um, the account of the brother that um, you were mentioning that was killed on March 8th, do you know what law enforcement unit um, is responsible for? It, it was the Sheriff's Department, LA Sheriff's Department, and his name was Dennis Todd Rogers. Thank you. Oh, and he had a degree in accounting. That's the, that, what's, the, what's the last name, Dennis? Todd Rogers. He had a degree in accounting. You know, this man, he had a life. He, he, he had a career. These and are people that are taken out of our community. And he was unarmed, correct? He was also unarmed. Thank you. See ya. I got myself out with the help of a lot of people, but I got out. 
right? But I'm still treated as if I'm not. As she stated before, police cameras, um, the cameras on, the, on their bodies don't do anything. We're not seeing the cops, we're only seeing the community. We know what the community's doing. Everybody's talking about that. Everybody shares. You go in a neighborhood after a shooting, everybody knows what happens. It's the cops who then, as she stated, go back and corroborate their stories. It's not us, right? Like, we need to readjust the funding that's going to police and put it back into our communities, right? We don't. I learned when I was at a vigil for this young man, this brother who was shot on Sawson. I learned there that there isn't, the community can't say, hey, this sister, this brother, this person is having a mental breakdown. There is no number that you can call to come get help for them. You can only call the cops. And we know how they respond to us. That needs to change. We need to change where our funding is going because the cops aren't for us. That guy um, in Anaheim, why is he living in, um, living in one place and, and serving in another community? That shouldn't happen. The people who we trust with human lives, look at doctors, look at therapists, right? Look at all the folks who we put our time and our energy in. Look at the amount of schooling that they need to do in order to take care of another human being. Yet cops have what? A couple of, you don't even have to graduate. You don't even need a degree. You just need a couple of, of courses. And if you're over a certain age and you go through a six month program, I believe I heard, that's not enough. That is not enough. And you can see by the fact that LA, what, the, uh, the county and whatever, they go back and forth between being the two most murderous uh, police folks in the country, we see the effects. Like it's time to change. Thank you. Serena, please get a form. Um, I want to know how many people know about Waukesha Wilson. Um, a year tomorrow. Um, why are video cameras being not available to the family? Why is Charlie Beck not releasing the videos to the family? Um, Waukesha Wilson was in the LA jail on a minor infraction. There's been many stories collaborated. She didn't pay herself. She didn't commit suicide. If that is the case, why is it taking a year, or basically saying that LAPD is not responsible? You're blaming them on the jail, which are still up under Charlie Betts. Demands. Okay, we're also going to talk about the situation in Inglewood, where two couples with seven children were shot in their car while they were sleeping. Why is it taking the LA, excuse me, the Inglewood mayor more than a year to continue to run and hide from the people that are demanding answers. This is what I need people to come together and think about. You can't just think about it, you have to take action, you have to get involved. We can't sit here and say that there's an answer for the police. It needs to be dismantled, the money that is being issued for them for these body cameras that continuously fall off and oh, no one knows that there's video showing what happens and the same police continue to walk Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why. If you're a decent person, ask yourself why. Why the money is being spent on body cameras, this, that, and the other, but yet there's no money in the community for elderly, for the homelessness, and for education. Ask yourself why. Ahmed Abdullah. Just real quickly, uh, one of the nights we're on the show, uh, Pierre Abdullah. With the eight one eight. With the great one eight. Yes. yes. Uh, I just wanted to say, aside from this conversation about what we can do in our current condition with police, we also have to think about after the fact. Let's think about the judicial system as well. Programs such as the Neighborhood Justice Program right the wrongs that a lot of these officers are doing. 
So when the local artist who doesn't have a canvas so goes out to the street and puts up his piece out there and he gets arrested, he's 16 years old, now he's going to have a lifetime of criminality. Through the Neighborhood Justice Program, they're able to essentially be tried by their own people within their community and not have some outsider essentially tell them, well, this is the $35,000 fine and you are now spending X amount of time in prison and now you have a record for your entire life which then, as we all know, creates the pipeline of poverty. So let's think of, as well as thinking about what we can do to reform the current condition and situation with police officers, let us also think about these programs that assist us in righting the wrongs that are being committed. Neighborhood Justice Program, Summer Night Lights Program. I'm not all for all the gang, the grid programs that are out there. There's a lot of, of inequities that are coming out from city programming at times, but it's actually something that's happening. So, at the very least, let's continue the funding of these types of programs because they prevent things from happening, they demystify the police community relations, and they also right the wrongs. And that's really at the heart of it. I've been able to be blessed enough to sit on during one of these neighborhood justice panels, and it's an amazing thing. You see the catharsis really happening within the individuals. And a lot of the times, if the community is involved in essentially sentencing them, quote unquote, but that language isn't used, Let's say, let's, let's put the quotes and quotes there. When the community is involved, the youth or the individual involved in the activity, the criminal or delinquent activity, is actually more apt to now having pride in their community and having this sense of ownership because they're granted that much. Thank you very much. That sounds like a restorative justice model you were talking about. Yes, restorative justice, definitely. Yeah. So it's a neighborhood justice program as part of, I believe, the city attorney's office. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I just want to thank everybody again uh, for coming out, for bringing your testimonies, for bringing the testimonies of others who might not have been able to come forward to talk with us today. As Commissioner Abdullah told you at the beginning, um, we will be uh, having a few more hearings. One is on April 8th, although I don't think we know where yet, which will be focused on women and LGBT community, queer community. Um, so uh, please look on the website. You can give your information to our staff and they'll let you know about the future hearings. Um, both that one as well as the one that's focused on law enforcement. Um, and of course, um, as she mentioned, we will be coming up with a report. Um, but that report will be reflecting all that we've heard from all of you um, and other communities around the county. Um, and our hope is not just that we will be um, persuading, educating the Board of Supervisors, but that we'll be working with all of you and your community groups um, in order to apply not just pressure from us, but pressure from all of you on what you want, you need, what we all need um, for our community broadly beyond policing. Um, so with that, I, um, I get to declare this public hearing adjourned and thank all of you for coming again. Hi, my name is Shelly Crawford. This is my son, Andre. Um, we have a situation where Andre was arrested um, from school and they did not notify me. But most, let me take you back to where it started from. Andre is my foster son. I'm his legal guardian. He's under an IEP, which gives him a right to stay in school until he's 22 if he wants to, but he's under an IEP. And I say that because I felt that when the police came to the school over an incident that happened off of campus, they should have called me and not waited to call me after they had come to him and took him to jail. Although I know he was 18 at the time, he still is under an IEP and there were records that they would have been found useful that probably would have prevented it had they called me and asked me about it. Uh, my main point is that once he was arrested, he stayed incarcerated for a day and a half. And um, I reached out to an organization that I'm a part of, which is the NAACP. And uh, the president came. We all met down in court. I had his regional service worker present. And at court, uh, the sheriff came out and he said they were going to release him. So he didn't even see a judge. He didn't even go into a courtroom to be charged with anything. 
um, or, or to be asked to come back. He was released and the charges were dismissed. Now this is a problem that I'm having today. Andre was sent a notice in the mail from Community Care Licensing stating that he, can, he can't for the rest of his natural life work at any child care facility, anything dealing with children because of the incident. However, he was never charged. We never went before a judge. Like I said, I think all of this would have been eliminated had the police called me from school. I feel that a new policy needs to be implemented that if the police come to the school, if it's a high school, no matter how old they are, they're still in high school. They're, he's under an IEP, and especially if you have a disability, I feel that the police, it, ha it should be mandated that they call the parent, the legal guardian, to come down before they arrest that child. Because to us, they are still children. They're in high school, he's under an IEP, and I think a lot of the heartache and humiliation that he suffered behind this would have been prevented had he been Caucasian, and had I been able to be present during the interviewing, they had him write something and sign it, and I hold his legal rights, so I should have been present. And that is a problem I'm having. I feel they need to have different policies um, implemented and put in place so that these kids that are falling under IEPs that already have disabilities, he's already, he, he has disabilities that have been diagnosed through a psychiatrist. There are things going on that could have been brought out to prevent this. And the young lady that it concerned uh, was his girlfriend of a while, and they had both agreed to something, and she was scared of her parents, so she just said anything, and from that, that's why the police were called in, if you want to know what happened. But um, just to keep it semi-private, I just want better policies for these kids, especially African-American kids, that fall under IEPs with disabilities that the parents, the legal guardians, need to be called first before they're drunk with money. And now he stands with a, uh, you know, just like something against him that'll prevent him from getting a job anywhere. And I'd like to have that expunged and removed completely. So there also needs to be a law in place that if they're not charged, if they don't go before a judge, that those need to automatically be erased off the books completely. That's it. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, I'm Jay Farrell. I'm a resident of Venice, California, and I would like to share with the committee some of the things that actually go on on a daily basis in Venice, California, as far as the people who have houses are concerned. Number one is they wake you up at 6, 6.30 in the morning, and you have to take down your dwelling and uh, leave the area. Uh, number two is that if you're caught uh, at that discretion, of course, anywhere in the area, they will write you uh, no lottery ticket. Uh, number three is that uh, they will not allow you to come back to your residence uh, until after nine o'clock uh, at night in order to lay down and go to sleep. And then at their discretion, they will come at 1, 2, or 3 o'clock in the morning and tell you about uh, 3 or 4 inches away from the curb, 36 inches away from the curb. You're blocking the sidewalk and write your citation and so on and so forth. And this is just plain harassment. And I really feel that because Google moved into the neighborhood, they have been especially uh, uh, dedicated to serving Google's wishes and not have anyone around their building. And I thank you for uh, letting me have an opportunity to speak. Okay, my complaint is that the horse cops do not belong in Venice, California. They're part of the Metro Division. They're not part of Pacific Division. They harass people continually. They bully, they intimidate. They have no vested interest in the community. And something the pastor just said is that police should know the families in the community. And the Metro Division is sending the horse cops to Venice and they are just have, it's like a war on the homeless.
A friend of mine was riding his bicycle on the boardwalk. He was homeless. And they stopped him. They gave him a ticket, and it turned into a big problem. They arrested him. Had a tourist been riding a bicycle on the boardwalk, they would have ignored it. So there's a um, just an attack on the homeless. And the horse cops are bullies. They harass. They intimidate. And I think they should be removed from Venice Beach. That's it. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I have uh, certain stories that I would like to share that I've experienced myself and, um, and other um, friends of mine um, facing police brutality um, where they're you know, being a little too aggressive um, and having a lack of understanding of the situation at hand, um, more so taking sides of the, the residents um, and adhering to their every call and need rather than fully understanding the situation and treating us um, um, as if we're a part of the community as well. Um, more so than just seeing us as a problem that the residents see us as and relate that to the police. So they see that so they see us as a problem too. And being called out on their behalf instead of instead of just having a common ground for each parties. Um, I mean I've seen a friend of mine you know, being harassed and being um, handled very aggressively when he was clearly um, speaking, you know, um, you know, speaking, speaking, you know, from very, from, from self-control and not, you know, being all out of this conduct you know, and complying to whatever they wanted to do, but they still were applying aggressive aggressive holds on them and, 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 and just making it look like he was acting all you know, out of his mind and, and, and as if he wasn't doing what they were saying but it was clearly and it was clear that he was saying and, 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 and acting according to everything they were saying to the point where they, they brought a, a medical truck and and um, and treated the case like he was being um, men mentally challenged when that wasn't the case. Um, <laughs> so what they did was they was cleaning up the street and one of the guys that was cleaning up posed himself to be uh, a police officer and, um, the, and my friend, um, you know, adhered to what he was saying and then later to find out that he wasn't a police officer, but posing as one so he can give some type of authority instruction to my friend. Um, but then him realizing he wasn't, you know, it's, it's false. I don't know what you would call it, but um, that's just, you know, that's just wrong or whatever. But I mean, as far as solutions, which I've heard, um, one should be where the, where the, I mean, because they're, you know, like we hire the police force for the community. So the community should have full um, control of how they control the community and, and, and how they go about certain protocols when attending to these needs that the community have. Um, um, and yeah, and, and people within the community, which I also heard a solution, um, are ones to be hired and to actually patrol the community. And they live there and understand the people and, and the things that go on within that community because everyone is different. So there's no way you can you can train a police officer in general for every community and know 
the ways of that community and the problems that really go on. So um, hiring within the community and, and, and only serving the community the way they want to be served is, is two of the prime solutions that need to be done. There's no other way. There's no other way, no other solutions that can be done the way it's set up now it has to be reconstructed. Um, so that's, that's, that's all I have to say. I'm uh, Peggy Lee Kennedy with the Venice Justice Committee and I wanted to be more clear about recommendations that I would give to the county uh, Human Relations Commission regarding uh, police. Uh, Proposition H was just passed and I would say that any spending, any one cent of that should have uh, oversight by people that are not part of, uh, say, social services that are dependent on city funding, so it influences their view, and uh, community members that aren't taking money uh, from law enforcement or the city or in league with law enforcement in some way. I think that they should be activists or people who are unhoused themselves. That's regarding Pripper, um, Proposition H, because the city did HHH, and they had this committee, but they got and even built into it to have this oversight committee for spending. But you know, it turned out that ex-city employees were hired and some such. But it didn't. It doesn't have real oversight. We need real oversight on the spending so that it isn't just law enforcement-led actions that are called services being. Uh, taken against homeless people like it's a war on them, which is how they treat it. It's a war against homelessness, and it's an assault by the LAPD. Um, another uh, thing I want to be sure to recommend the County uh, Human Relations Commission is that any spending besides uh, Proposition H, uh, we form a more formal committee and really look at this spending and how much of it is in, uh, intertwined with law enforcement because law enforcement should not be the first responder to homeless people. We should be looking at all of the issues. There's a lot of issues and a lot of different types of people that are homeless for different reasons. You cannot provide services based on law enforcement when there's no housing. It doesn't make any sense. It's a waste of our money and it's very expensive. Thank you. Oh, um, yes, my name is Wes, and I just want to say that I've been listening to a lot of solutions, but I haven't heard no real clear solution to, to the problem. And it's, it's, it's real simple. When you have cancer inside your body, what do you do? You go in and you extract the cancer out of your body. And throughout the black community for years and years and years, Every rebellion that we've had since 1865 has involved the police. So, what we need to do is simply take white policemen out of the black community. That's going to be the solution. All of us want to play basketball with them, talk to them and all this, it's not going to work. To be trained is not going to work. They're trained. They're trained to do what they want to do, is to kill black folks. So you guys got to start voting correctly, getting rid of the Ridley Thomases, getting rid of Maxine Waters, who don't stand up for the black community. And this is what we're going to have to do, or we're going to continue to suffer. <laughs>